Good morning. I'm Asan Giordano, and this is your DMV Daily Dose for Tuesday, January 28th, 2020. It's currently cloudy and 39 degrees in Baltimore. Expect mostly clear skies starting in the morning. Today's high will be 44 degrees, and the low will be 37. Marilyn Matters is reporting on a Republican leader in the House of Delegates who backed a measure opposed by Governor Larry Hogan, who has moved to have his name taken off a bill. The measure, House Bill 292, would require the state to get the approval of affected counties before building a toll-financed highway, bridge, or tunnel. Existing law requires the state to get local approval in nine eastern shore counties. But House Bill 292 and its Senate cross-file bill sponsor, SB 229, would expand local sign-off power to all 23 counties and the city of Baltimore. But House Deputy Minority Whip Sid Tsai, a Republican from Anne Arundel County, agreed to co-sponsor the bill at the start of the session. But he has since filed to have his name removed. Saab still believes local government should have a seat at the table when toll facilities are being planned. But he only wants Anne Arundel County to gain that new power. In an interview on Friday, he struggled to explain the apparent double standard. Quote, I believe that our citizens should have a say, that local governments should have a say where things go, he said. I just didn't know that House Bill 292 is going to cover the entire state. Saab denied that the administration leaned on him to remove his support from the measure that could derail the efforts that they have in place. Well, the Baltimore Sun is reporting on a story that we've been following and reporting to you on this podcast for the past few weeks. Governor Larry Hogan appointed Chanel Branch to the Maryland House of Delegates on Monday, filling the seat of former Delegate Cheryl Glenn, who recently resigned and pleaded guilty to federal corruption charges. Now, Branch, who is a Democrat, was nominated after a controversial meeting two weeks ago in which she cast a deciding vote for herself. The seven members of the 45th Legislative District of Baltimore City's Democratic State Central Committee, which Branch chairs, were tasked with choosing Glenn's replacement. She got three votes. Branch's nomination revived a debate about the way the General Assembly vacancies are filled and whether the process does enough to consider voters' voices. Some Maryland legislators are pushing for future appointees to stand for election in the next regularly scheduled statewide election. But we want to congratulate the newly appointed delegate and hopefully have her on our show really soon. Last night, human service providers from across the city who are on the front lines of trying to help curb crime in Baltimore by way of juvenile and adult reform efforts came together to bring forth solutions to the current crime epidemic the city is facing. Barring news cameras and any politicians, with the exception of one, former Baltimore Mayor Sheila Dixon, who they said have shown a unique understanding on how to address crime when she was in office, the men and women, a part of this emergency response to violence summit, came together in Northeast Baltimore, led by Jumok founder Zach Dinkle a leading Democratic candidate for city council in the 4th District, who chose to not even mention his own candidacy during the nature of the event. Quote, we are the service providers that have many of the answers for our community, and while the current class of politicians have yet to reach out to any of us to help them with this crime crisis, we decided we had to come together on our own to provide solutions for the communities in which we serve. This is about saving lives and winning souls, not some political campaign, said Dingle. So tonight I'm Zach Dingle of Jamok, but tomorrow I'll hit the doors and speak with voters as Zach Dingle, the city council candidate. A part of the problem, he said, in this city is that the politicians only come around and get serious about doing something when it's an election year, instead of being sincere about their efforts and consistent with them. And that's why they said he said that they invited Mayor Dixon because she was mayor when they were brought in to help her reduce crime in the city because she knew their value. And they she had no problem going out as a part of her overall mission to help curb crime. 
Now, Dixon is set to roll out her crime plan in the coming days and took the opportunity to listen and learn while providing insight into city services and contracts for those at the table when asked. She said that it is the men and women in this room that will be necessary to change the culture of how this city thinks and operates and said that it has to be a holistic approach and not some top-down approach coming from City Hall or the Baltimore City Police Department. Now, last night, members of the Baltimore City Council, especially bill sponsor, Councilman Christopher Burnett, a Democrat of the 8th Councilmatic District, were shocked to see that Mayor Bernard C. Jack Young reluctantly signed into law the legislation set to become law without his signature last night anyway. The city's newly created campaign finance system for political campaigns is now law in the city of Baltimore affording candidates an option to opt into a new system that will require a certain threshold of low dollar donations before the city would then kick in matching dollars to help those smaller candidates compete with the larger candidates who raise money largely from high priced developers. Now the legislation, which was offered up to the councilman by yours truly two years ago, was first approved by the citizens of Baltimore overwhelmingly on the 2018 general election ballot. And this bill, which is now law, certified those efforts with the details on how to put forth these efforts, as well as the approval and details behind putting forth the, the commission that will be tasked with ensuring that this fund is fully funded. And while Mayor Young appears dead set against the legislation and ensuring it's fully operational, despite reluctantly signing it yesterday without any fanfare and not even telling the sponsor of the bill about it, another mayoral candidate immediately put out a statement in regards to her full support of the measure. Former Mayor Dixon issued her thoughts and congratulations on her social media pages, stating in part that here's the actual draft without the shot of Jackson and Post. I would like to congratulate Councilman Christopher Burnett and the men and women who fought so hard for the passage of what has now become law, the city's public financing program for candidates seeking political office. If elected mayor, I vow to find the funds to ensure that this fund is fully operational and will appoint a fair election fund commission filled with election advocates and activists from across the city willing to see Baltimore expand its electoral engagement within the city's diverse neighborhoods and communities. I am encouraged and excited that Baltimore City has become Maryland's fourth jurisdiction to pass such legislation, and I can assure you that you will have a champion for public financing when I'm elected to lead this city forward. Also happening at last night's council meeting, Councilwoman Shannon Sneem and Council President Brandon Scott are heading a to push legislation in Baltimore that will require collective bargaining agreements for major city projects. The East Baltimore duel said that it would lead to more local workers earning wages that could sustain their families. However, groups representing contractors opposed the bill, saying that it would put minority businesses at a disadvantage and ignores the reality of the city's largely non-union construction workforce. Now, the Democratic council members argue structural change is necessary to tackle problems that have long plagued Baltimore City, including unemployment and crime. At last night's meeting, Council President Scott also introduced legislation that I had been pushing for for at least a decade. And ironically, Councilman Scott at the time was never in favor of it. But now he's calling for the Board of Estimates to be reformed. The five-member board is made up of the mayor, the council president, the comptroller, and two mayoral hires, and is responsible for approving all purchases, contracts, and settlements worth more than $25,000. Now, the city solicitor and the public works director, the two mayoral appointees, traditionally vote with their boss, the mayor. But Scott's proposal would cut the mayoral appointees from the board weakening a mayor's control over the city budget and leaving only the three citywide elected officials. Scott, who is running for mayor, said the change would increase transparency and improve discussions on how tens of millions of taxpayer dollars are spent. It would also mean that two board members could team up to determine the outcome of any particular expense. The measure is a charter amendment, meaning it would need voters' approval to become law.
I'm your man, Mr. Politics, and this has been your DMV Daily Dose for Tuesday, January 28th, 2020. For more information on the articles that I've mentioned, just go on over to that website at www.dmvdaily.news.